that was pre-dialysis. Let's step into dialysis. If you're a dialysis patient, this is for you. Can plant-based nutrition still help you? Same thing. We're going to follow that same pattern to keep it uniform. I'm going to go with the case study. I'm going to go with the history. And then I'm going to tell you what the research is saying. Case studies. Okay. Can you eat a plant-based diet on dialysis? Yes. So this is an end-stage renal disease male. Um, this is what his diet consisted of. It was like fruits, vegetables, nuts, seeds, and grains. He made sure they were always unrefined. That means not processed. So he wasn't eating processed junk food with artificial coloring and flavoring. He was eating whole plant foods. He only ate about two meals a day. He was very active. He climbed, he walked, he swam. He loved the outdoors. He's devoted to his prayer life. Um, and just he kept a very positive outlook um, on, on his chronic condition, on his disease, which is also super important, um, even, along with nutrition, is to just have that positive outlook. Um, his medications, some of you on dialysis will recognize this. He was on epigen. He was on a phosphate binder. Um, but the rest of his medications, he had replaced with herbal formulas and natural means. If you ever want to do something like that, make sure you work with your doctor or your dietitian before you do it. Um, he was dialyzed for three times a week um, for three to five hours per treatment. So he was an in-center um, dialysis patient. But he said that unlike all the other people around him on dialysis after treatment, he was ready to go without any sluggishness. I firmly believe it's because of the way that he ate. So people say, oh, well, I can't do that. My phosphorus will go too high. My potassium will go too high. I'll become malnourished. Here's his labs. His calcium is perfect. Phosphorus, potassium, perfect. Albumin, perfect. Um, phosphorus from plant-based sources is much more poorly absorbed. We're going to go over that, but everything, he had the most perfect labs. So ESRD female, same thing. She ate a whole food plant-based diet. Um, one time she did have an elevated potassium and what she did, the reason that, that it got high is because she was doing smoothies with high potassium fruits and vegetables in there. So anytime, if you're doing like a juice or a smoothie, you're going to grind that fiber cell. And so you'll, you'll much more readily absorb that potassium. So that is why her potassium went high. Once she pulled out those high potassium fruits and vegetables out of the smoothie, she was fine. Um, she did general exercise like yoga. Um, and she was on epigen. She was also on IV vitamin D and she was on phosphate binders. Uh, she initially dialyzed three times a week, um, but was able to decrease to twice weekly because her creatinine level was low. So, and that was, I, I believe, had a lot to do with her diet. What did her labs look like? Phosphorus, perfect. Potassium, perfect. Albumin, perfect. And her creatinine actually got better. It decreased from 10.81 to 7.33 when she switched to a whole food plant-based diet on dialysis. Okay. So here we are again. You may be saying, well, why did my doctor or dietitian tell me to eat white bread and meat? OK, that those habits die hard. So, again, now we've got to step back into history for me to explain that to you. Um, historical dialysis is uh, heavily focused on protein quality and protein deficiency. Um, it focuses heavily on just the kidneys. It forgets the whole patient. Um, the, some people are still going by the outdated KDOKI guidelines. KDOKI is just the, um, the guidelines for America for kidney disease is all that is. Um, and so with that, they're following the outdated quote, renal diet. There is no renal diet anymore. It should be individualized to every person. Okay. So let's start with that protein quality, um, the historical meat focus, Okay, why is that there? Historically, protein what is, has been categorized, like how do I tell if a protein's good? Well, we're going to go with high biological value protein. That is so antiquated. Um, that phrase, even that phrase, I do not love that phrase, high biological value. How did they come up with that? So um, high biological value came from these nitrogen balance studies. So, but these nitrogen balance studies aren't really very accurate because the studies did not consider varying calorie intakes. So they're very confounded. Confounded means like very confused. 
because the remember I said earlier that if you don't eat enough calories, you will use the protein you eat as energy. You have to eat enough calories to preserve that protein. So that didn't work. Also, um, there was a study with intensive care unit uh, patients in 2022. And, and one thing that the researchers there walked away with from their study and from previous studies is um, not taking into account the calorie um, intake, but also total energy expenditure. So some people have a higher metabolism. They're going to expend calories more than others. Today, you might expend more calories than you do tomorrow, right? So even though you can meticulously try to use nitrogen balance studies to evaluate protein, these researchers concluded that um, such errors like in energy expenditure and calorie intake are, un are likely even in our own studies. So they're saying that this research is really, there's too many errors, even in our own study. Um, and then if we were, if we were even to use nitrogen balance studies, there was a meta-analysis that showed there was no significant difference between animal protein, vegetable protein, or mixed sources. And that's because if you eat a variety of plants, you still get all the amino acids you need. If you eat animal protein, you may get it in one fell swoop, but if you eat a variety, you're still going to get it. All right. So Nitrogen balance has kind of gone to the side a little bit. It's still there a little bit. And so people have opted now for um, something called protein digestibility corrected amino acid scores. You don't have to remember that long name, PDCAA. How does this, how does this measure protein quality? So we're, what we're doing is we're giving protein a grade by these, these things I'm describing to you. So this is the newer preferred method. Um, the first thing, there's three ways that it, that it grades a protein. It looks at its essential amino acid composition. Okay. Well, I just said, of course, in this in this scale, animal protein is going to score higher because it has all the essential amino acids. But if you eat a variety of plant foods, you're still going to get all the essential amino acids. Um, digestibility. So this is really skewed because they use fecal or stool studies to determine digestibility. The problem is that protein is is di is absorbed further up in the GI tract. So if you're using stool, right, you're way down in the GI tract. But if you're up where it's actually being absorbed in the ileum, that's way up in the small intestines, then really you need to be looking at ileal studies. And there is a protein scoring um, test that does that called DIAS, but you'll never see it because it's only used in research. So digestibility really doesn't make sense either. Um, and then this is really strange. The PDCAAs are based on the requirement of a two to five year old child. Okay. The first problem with that is when we're looking at adults, you're not a two to five year old child. The second problem with that is that um, the, the study that, that was performed on these two to five year old children were malnourished children recovering from malnutrition. So that really kind of skews that. And even if they weren't recovering from malnutrition, the most demanding age nutritionally is two to five years of age. So it skews the scoring of these amino acids. One is the best possible score. And I think I've already explained everything else on that slide. What am I saying? What is my point here? There are major issues with high biological value protein and PDCAAs, but this is still the story in dialysis. You're going to be told, oh, you're going to become protein malnourished. Oh, you've got to get more protein. You do lose protein in the dialysis machine. If you're on hemodialysis or especially peritoneal dialysis, you are going to lose protein in through your treatment. But you can easily replace that, as we saw in the two case studies, with plant proteins as long as you're eating enough and you're eating a varied diet. Both of these two ways that they score protein that makes it where you feel like you have to have animal protein in your diet uh, are based on single foods and not a mixed diet. They're over-restricted diets. Um, if, if you're eating an over-restricted diet, you're going to have deficiencies, whether you're eating animal or plant-based. Um, so the historical focus on protein quality to improve nutrition status is overemphasized, and it's really only part of the picture when, when it comes to dialysis patients. So speaking of nutrient deficiency, 
Kate Oki presents the historical dialysis diet. So old Kate Oki guidelines. Um, this is historical because thankfully it's been changed. But the old Kate Oki guidelines forgot the whole patient. If you're a dialysis patient, you still have a liver, you still have a heart, you have a brain, you have arteries and veins. And so if you're eating this deficient diet, high in meat, low in fiber, low in vitamins and minerals, it's not a good thing. There were strict potassium and phosphorus restrictions that did not consider overall health in this historical diet, but it's very hard to change mindsets, especially for someone who has been in dialysis a really long time. So if your dietitian or your doctor has been there a really long time and they're still kind of saying the same things, it's because they're still back on the historical Kadoki diet. Again, you be your best advocate. You be activated in your care. You are the most important team member on your healthcare team. You know your body better than anyone else. So the outdated renal diet, this is what it looked like. We would say, oh, you can only eat white bread, no whole grains, because whole grains are high in phosphorus. The problem is that phosphorus is bound in phytate, so you're not even going to absorb it that well. So you can eat whole grains. Uh, lots of animal protein. Well, we just went through a whole discussion about why that is not necessary. Um, no beans, no peas, same thing. High in phosphorus, also high in potassium, but the fiber in those helps decrease the absorption of both potassium and phosphorus. And there is no blanket number for phosphorus and potassium for a restriction. And I'm going to show you why in a minute. Minimal fruit. You can eat fruit. Um, no high potassium vegetables. If you run a high potassium, yes, you may need to back up on some of the high potassium vegetables. If you don't, you can eat some of those high potassium vegetables. Everybody is different. If you're on peritoneal dialysis, likely your potassium will go low. So you don't even have a potassium restrictions more times than not on peritoneal dialysis. And fiber is not even considered in this outdated diet, and it should be. So what are the new Kadoki guidelines? <clears throat> Old Kadoki guidelines, potassium for every single patient, 40 milligrams per kilogram of ideal body weight or standard body weight. Now it's individualized per your lab. If your lab is perfect every month and you're eating high potassium fruits and vegetables, continue on. Phosphorus, 800 to 1,000 milligrams per patient. It was across the board. That's what we did. Now, Kadoki guidelines in 2020 say this should be individualized per your lab. If your lab is running fine, then you can have more phosphorus. If not, then maybe you need to back up a little bit. But remember that the phosphorus in plant-based foods is not going to be as well absorbed. <music>